Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for an ever-changing Casco Bay. Hi, I'm Will Everett, Executive Director of Friends of Casco Bay. Of course, our mission is improve and protect the environmental health of the Bay. We appreciate each of you for joining us today. My job is simple, it's to introduce science and advocacy associate Heather Kenyon, who is uh, on screen with me here. I'm excited about today's event. One of the things I love about Friends of Casco Bay is I learn something new every day. Uh, we'll be learning from staff scientists Mike Doan, community organizer Sarah Freshley, and Casco Bay keeper Ivy Frenoka. We're all gonna share their experiences uh, out on the Bay this year. Tell us what changes they and our volunteers have been seeing, what we're learning from our scientific and observational data, and how these data are being used to move the needle for a healthier, uh, more protected Casco Bay. Leading us in this conversation will be Heather Kenyon. Uh, she joined our staff in 2022 as our science and advocacy associate, a role that we created uh, thanks to the Climate Change at Casco Bay Fund, a uh, fund which many of you on uh, this event uh, donated to, so thank you for that. Heather is multi-talented. She has a background in marine science uh, and environmental policy. She's done scientific research through scuba diving in Florida Keys. She studied law at Maine Law, where she was editor of the Ocean and Coastal Law Journal. She works with our staff scientist, Mike Doan, to deploy our monitoring equipment and analyze our data. And she works with Casco Baykeeper Avi Pinoka to put those data into action as part of our advocacy work. Friends, I give you Heather Kenyon. Take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Will. Welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in as the program team discusses our data and our advocacy and our community engagement over the last year. We titled this program Ever Changing Casco Bay for a reason. We are a 30 year organization. We've collected data for all 30 of those years. And what we're seeing is that the Bay is changing. The problems that the Bay faces also change. And in order to continue to meet our mission, our organization has changed as well, but we've changed for the positive. We now have four, pro four people on our program team, and I'm going to take a minute to introduce everybody, but this is the first time that we've had four people on the, on the program team. It used to be Mike and Ivy just juggling all the balls, and now we have four of us juggling all the balls. And we're thrilled because it's really increased our capacity to meet our mission. So I'm going to introduce Mike Doan first. He is our staff scientist. He is also the person that has been with Friends of Casco Bay the longest, I think 25 years. I stopped counting. <laughs> Probably. So he has a really in-depth knowledge of the Bay and of the organization. And next, I'd like to introduce Sarah Freshly. She is our community organizer and volunteer coordinator. You will hear more from Sarah in a minute, but her position is brand new. She's been with us since March, and we're thrilled to have her. And last, but of course not least, Ivy Frignoka, our beloved Casco Bay Keeper, the lead advocate of the Bay. So the four of us that you see here is the program team, and we are working hard, like I said, to meet our mission. And we're going to go through uh, some of what we have accomplished over the past year, some of the changes that we've seen as well. So Mike, I'm gonna invite you to stay on with us first. Mm -hmm. And let's let's just start at the basics and tell everybody a bit about Friends of Casco Bay's monitoring programs. Sure, of course. Um, we've been monitoring the water quality of Casco Bay for actually 31 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been doing that uh, through two uh, long-term water quality monitoring programs. And that's what you're, you're looking at here in this map of Casco Bay. Uh, the blue dots represent our oldest water quality monitoring program, uh, our seasonal program. And we go to each of those blue dots once a month, every May through October. And we do that now as a team. So we, we uh, as much as, as often as possible, we get all of us together, Ivy and myself and Heather and Sarah, and we'll go out to those blue dots, which are spread across the Bay and, and understand a little more about 
the health of the bay at that moment in time. And this also allows us to go out and and see the bay and to talk to people who are recreating and, and working on the bay. It's it's a it's a great program. Um, if it's a shallow site, we'll we'll take measurements at the surface. If it's a deeper site, we'll take measurements down through the water column. Um, but again, that's a, a long term program. Thirty one years of data now. Uh, about 10 years ago, we, we thought we needed more data, more frequent data collection to really understand how the bay is changing, because it is changing. And so our newer uh, program is the Continuous Monitoring Program. And these are the three yellow stars you see on the map, one in Portland Harbor, one in roughly the middle of the bay off Yarmouth, and one all the way over to the east in Harpswell. Only three stations, but they collect data every 15 minutes year round. So certainly a lot more data. And we, we collect all that data with this instrument here on the right. This is a, a data sonde. It's a multi-parameter instrument. Um, and all of these uh, silver cylinders here at the business end are um, unique sensors. And they tell us something about different parts of the bay, different ways we look at the health of the bay. Uh, we look at the, the water temperature, of course, with this instrument. We look at the salinity in the bay, how salty the bay is. We look at the amount of oxygen dissolved in the bay. And that's an important one because it's it's not only a really important indicator of the health of the bay, but all the critters that live in the bay need oxygen to respire just as we do on land. We also look at water clarity through a measurement called turbidity. We look at the we actually look at the amount of of microscopic uh, marine plants in the bay. And of course, we look at the acidity of the bay through pH. And while we're out on the sea, uh, both programs actually, we collect bottle samples for nitrogen analysis. So a lot of data over many it years. Is a lot of, it is a lot of data, Mike. So between those two programs and um, all of those measurements that you just went through, collecting all of those measurements, what we do at the end of every season is we put all the data together and we take a look at it. And yes, our data is available to others. Um, Sarah will drop a link to our website where we display all of our data. It's not our raw data. We have a lot of graphs on there, um, but we're always happy to share data. So we go through all of this data at um, the end of the season and we analyze it and we look at it and we pull out some important features. Mike, I know we had important features, some very notable features from this summer. What were they? Uh, three things jump out immediately. Uh, the water temperature was up again. We had a warmer Casco Bay. Uh, you may have noticed all the rain we had last summer, spring. We had actually lower salinity in Casco Bay because of all that rainfall. And finally, our dissolved oxygen levels were a bit lower last year than they have been historically. So it's something to keep an eye on. And there is a fourth, actually. I, I'll talk about those three, but I want to mention um, we don't have our nitrogen data back from the lab yet, from the analysis. So that will be very interesting. And, and look for an update um, when we get that data in, because excess nitrogen is a pollutant. And we get excess nitrogen through stormwater. And we certainly had plenty of that this year. And just as a really quick example, um, stormwater volumes in the city of Portland, uh, mm -hmm. CSOs specifically, which is a, a mixture of stormwater and sewage. Um, if we look back at 2022, a much drier year, the total volume between January and August uh, from the CSOs in Portland was 70 million gallons, which is a lot, but uh, doesn't really compare to this year. Uh, over the same time period where we had over 250 million gallons of, of mixed stormwater and sewage getting into the bay. And that brings a lot of pollutants, including nitrogen with it. So um, that's just a, a look ahead. Um, there'll be nitrogen yeah. data available shortly. Yeah, that's a yikes moment. We, we are yes. super excited to get the nitrogen data back so we can see what, if any, all of that stormwater, what the effect was. So, okay, talking about temperature, salinity, and dissolved, dissolved oxygen, can you go a little deeper for everyone sure. on those three measurements I to just give them have an, an idea? Yes, of course. Um, I'll start with uh, temperature. 
Um, I have three graphs to share with you on temperature, then I have two graphs on salinity, and finally just one graph on oxygen. So we'll start with temperature. And what you're looking at here is all 31 years of data uh, we've been collecting um, these measurements through our seasonal program. This is seasonal data, 1993 at the bottom here across 2023. So you're moving through time. The uh, blue dots represent the annual average for water temperature each year. And you really don't need that red trend line to tell you that the water is getting warmer. That, that line is going up. Um, in fact, we have warmed um, a little over a degree Fahrenheit per decade. So since we started collecting data through the seasonal program, our bay is, is over three degrees warmer than it was, which is, which is a, a, a huge number when it comes to water temperature. Mm -hmm. um, jumping to our continuous monitoring program, this is a different kind of slide, different kind of graph. We're looking at data from the Yarmouth Continuous Monitoring Station, and we're looking at this year's data compared against historic data. So you're looking at daily averages. Um, the gray shaded area you see here is the range of measurements of daily means, daily averages, uh, from the highest to the lowest. The gray line through that shaded area is the average of all the historic data. And what I want to do real quickly is compare this year's water temperature data, which is the dark blue line, against those historic uh, numbers. And you can see here we had a very warm uh, winter once again. Um, we were either at the top of that maximum range or above it in, in some cases here. Uh, we had some um, you know near average temperatures as well. But overall, another very warm year so far um, in, in Casco Bay. And finally, uh, this is just of interest to me. This is a different kind of graph again. Uh, this is data from this year. That's why the, the lines stop here around November. We are comparing the stations. So each line is a different station. Again, water temperature. The dark blue line is Portland Harbor data. Uh, the light blue line is Harpswell, and the green is Yarmouth. And we expect differences between the stations, uh, which, which you see here in the summer. While the trend over time might be the same, um, each station has a very different uh, characteristic. And they were different right up until this gap here. And this was the hurricane. And there's a gap because we uh, wanted to make sure the stations didn't get broken or damaged. We took them out of the water. Um, so there's a gap there where we weren't collecting data. When we took them out of the water, you can see the differences between the stations. When the station went back in, all three stations went back in a couple of days later, you can see how well mixed the bay had become. All those big winds, uh, big waves from that hurricane really did mix the bay, homogenize the bay. So it, uh, the lines became much closer together. But that was just of interest. Let's jump to salinity if we can. Um, we're looking again at Yarmouth Continuous Monitoring Station data. And again, we're comparing this year's data to historic data, the historic data in the gray, this year's data in the dark blue. I do want to note this big drop off in the spring. We expect that every year. This is what we call the spring freshet. All of the snow and ice that's melting in the watersheds, running down the rivers and getting into Casco Bay. And it does drop the salinity a bit. Um, but we didn't expect um, before this year was how low the salinity might go because of the rainfall we saw all spring and summer. And that's what you're seeing here, how much lower this blue line is below the gray, how much lower the salinity was this year when compared to historic data. Um, and we'll, we'll zoom in just a bit. Um, we're still looking at this year's data. This is just zoomed in on only August of this year. We're still at the continuous monitoring station in Yarmouth. And we're still looking at salinity, which is the green line. I want to introduce um, the blue line, which is flow out of the Royal River, which is pretty far away from the station. But um, you can see when we had a rain event here uh, in uh, August 9th, August 10th, there was a big spike in the amount of water coming out of the Royal River. The volume increased. At the same time, the salinity at the station decreased dramatically. Um, after that rain event, um, the river flow went back to normal, but it takes the rest of the month for the uh, the salinity to kind of rebound to where we expect it. So it's a lot of fresh water. We don't see this normally. It's an example of having uh, almost twice as many big rain events this past year than we normally do. Um, rain events greater than two inches or more of precipitation. So 
Uh, it really did make a difference. And the big takeaway for me is all of that, that rainwater, all of that storm water doesn't just bring fresh water. It brings a lot of pollutants as well. So you can only imagine what came down into the bay uh, with all that fresh water. But let's leave salinity. I have one last slide. Dissolved oxygen, I talked about how important this was, not only as an, an indicator of the health of the bay, but how important it is to everything that lives in the bay. And we had very low oxygen levels. This, once again, is Yarmouth data from the Continuous Monitoring Station. This year's data in blue, historic data in gray. And we are below those minimum lines for a lot of the year. And that's concerning. Um, my big takeaway here is that one of the things that might be going on is that warmer water holds less oxygen than cold water just because of physics. And as our waters in the bay continue to get warmer, this might be something we want to pay even closer attention to. These low levels aren't really low enough yet to, to really get us too concerned, but they are lower than they have been previously. And I do encourage everyone to go to the website and follow along. These graphs are there and updated as quickly as we can. Thank you, Mike. I think the last point that you just made is that, you know, the dissolved oxygen levels aren't, they're not concerning too much yet, this, but, think, yes. right. yeah. but we know that the bay keeps changing. And so collecting exactly. this data is going to be just as imperative in the future as well. Right. So along with all of that data, um, we also measure for ocean acidification. Right. And we started doing that about eight years ago when we deployed our first uh, continuous monitoring station at Yarmouth. And we are making some changes there, some exciting changes. Very exciting. Let's share with everybody what those are. Sure, absolutely. Um, my last slide. Um, <laughs> So as, as excited as I am to be on the program team at Friends of Casco Bay, I also uh, work with the Sensor Squad, which is a, a very serious group. Um, don't let the slide fool you. And I can't take credit. Uh, another member of the Sensor Squad pulled this slide together. But it's a group of us, a scientist uh, from Wells National Estuary Research Reserve, Jeremy, who created the slide, and Dr. Chris Hunt from the University of New Hampshire, as well as myself, the three of us as the sensor squad are, are working really hard to improve the accuracy of the acidification data we collect. We are close to the end of the first year of a two-year program, and it's been really positive. We've got some really exciting things to share uh, moving forward, but I'll leave you with that thought that we are changing the way we collect data as the bay continues to change, and we are uh, hopefully dramatically improving the accuracy. Thanks, Mike. And we'll be sure to update everybody on those changes as they happen. We're really excited about them and we're definitely going to be sharing updates as we do. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. Thank you. Sarah, I'd like to invite you on. Many of you know Sarah Freshly already, but if you don't, she is our community organizer and volunteer coordinator. She's been with us full time since March. And previously, a little plug here, the duties of Sarah's position were fulfilled by Sarah Lyman, who also happened to take on development duties at the same time. Um, fear not, Sarah Lyman is still with us as development director, bringing her expertise there. And we are so grateful for everything she does behind the scenes. Um, but this is the first time that we have had somebody dedicated to community organizing. So, Again, another way that our program is changing and increasing our capacity. So let's start kind of like we did with Mike about, you know, start at the basics. Tell us about your position and what it entails. Thanks, Heather. So in my role as community organizer and volunteer coordinator, I listen to our community and their observations and concerns for the Bay. Well, at the same time, I educate our community about marine science and our priority issues in the Bay. So you do, you do a lot of um, education. You held some, some programs this summer and we'll talk about that later. I'm wondering how, if you can share with everybody how our community helps us because that's also a really important aspect of the program team. So the people that interact with Casco Bay on a regular basis are the experts 
of their own backyard. And we really rely on this expertise to help us improve and protect the health of Hasco Bay. We have this amazing program called Water Reporter, which is a mobile application on your phone uh, that our community members use to upload their photos and observations. Casco Bay has 578 miles of coastline, and as a staff of 10, we just cannot be everywhere all at once. And so we really rely on our community members um, who are out on the bay on a regular basis, walk along the bay, swim in the bay, put on the bay, work on the bay, you need it. Um, to really keep track, especially since it is changing so frequently, we really rely on these these updates um, and, and observations for our community. Yeah, I think something that you said just said that's really important is, and thinking about what we just heard from Mike, we can collect all this data, right, from these scientific instruments, but the people that live and work on the bay are experts in their own right and we need to know what they know and so this is really important that you're with us making the connection with the community um but back to those events that i mentioned you held a bunch this summer tell us a little bit about those events what they entailed i know i was at one for stormwater and we had doug ron karate from the city of portland there and i thought it went great but I wasn't at all of them. So tell everybody what happened at the rest. Yeah. So I held several events throughout the summer season, specifically water reporter events, which anyone is welcome to, but we do cater them around water reporters because we really want to educate water reporters about what to look for. What is eel crap versus large? We can report from water at all. What is the flood fauna look for? in order for those photos to be most helpful for us. So we had several events all the way from Harpswell to South Portland this summer. Um, and we pulled experts such as a marine geologist to tell us about salt marsh erosion, an invasive species expert. As Heather mentioned, we had Portland Stormwater Program coordinator come. And we even had a observation expert to help us tune in for our when we are observing the coastline and the bay. So these events are great to learn about our work and connect with our community. And I really look forward to having more in this upcoming season. So Mike mentioned, you know, that there were some big takeaways that he that he and I took from the data collected. There were some big takeaways from the summer. There were also some big takeaways from water reporters this summer. And I know you have some slides to share with everybody on those. So let's hear them. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to show you some photos from water reporters themselves so you can see how these photos really help us in the park. So one of the big ticket items is eel grass. Um, in 2022, we learned that in Casco Bay alone, we had lost 54% of our grass heads. Um, they are still declining. We don't have an updated number, but we really love it when our water reporters keep an eye on the eelgrass beds for us. So this is a photo of an eelgrass bed at Willard Beach in South Portland. Normally eelgrass lives underwater and you can't see it without a mask and a snorkel. However, really low tides these eelgrass heads are exposed and so really love is really helpful when our water reporters take photos of these exposed eelgrass beds this one is a beautiful robust eelgrass bed and it really warms our little nerdy hearts to to see it uh, doing so well especially with the data that that's coming back so this is a this is really helpful to get these photos of eelgrass bed Another big ticket item that we saw this summer is erosion. So we're witnessing storms increasing intensity, which leads to greater events of erosion all at once. So we received many photos like this one showcasing the aftermath of some of these large storms. And we often set out notifications to our water reporters to take photos of an area before and after a major storm event so we can gauge the damage that happened during a particular storm. 
And the third big ticket item this summer, as Mike talked about, was stormwater and the amount of rain that we got this summer. So even though our focus is on Casco Bay, what happens in the watershed of Casco Bay, in the freshwater areas, all of that drains into Casco Bay. So we care about what's happening at the watershed as well. This is a photo of the Royal River in Yarmouth. Some of you may be familiar with this area right here. Those of you who are familiar, you know that normally the water does not look this high, it's raging, and also this brown. So this was um, a photo that was taken by a water reporter. It really helps us to draw the line between what's, what people are seeing and what's going on and data that we're gathering. As Mike showed in one of those graphs, we could see the drop in salinity all the way out Cousins Island. And that same week that we saw that drop in salinity, the water report to picker of the river um, just looking so full of water. So we really love making those connections between the quantitative and the qualitative data. Yeah, we got some amazing water reporter posts this summer. Um, I could have, I would have put money on an issue that we typically see in the past that we did not see this summer. I was shocked that no pictures came in on this. What were that? What was that? Dun, da, da, da. Nuisance algal blooms. So in the past few years in the summer, our water report report heavily on nuisance algal blooms, which are shown in this picture. So you can see the salt marsh grass up front here, but then out on the mud flats is that huge green mat of algae. These are great occurrences in the summer. These algal blooms, they occur because of an excess of nitrogen pollution and also warm temperatures in the bay. However, this summer, we didn't see many, many algal bloom posts, if any. And if we did, they were just in much smaller patches, not uh, covering a huge swath of a mud flat like this. And without our water reporters posting on both the presence and the absence of algal blooms, we would have assumed that there were algal blooms happening in the bay. But because so many of our dedicated water reporters reported on the absence of algal blooms, we got confirmation that in fact these nuisance algal blooms really were occurring somewhere. And we don't know why that is. As Mike said, we're waiting on our nitrogen data back, and we still have some data analysis to do, but a big question that we're asking this year. Yeah, that really underscores the point, how much we rely on our water reporters. Mike talked about changes that he's making in the monitoring program, and we have also more exciting changes happening in the water reporter program, but you know those changes best. So let's uh, update everybody on those. Yes, ever, ever changing. Casco Bay, friends of Casco Bay. Yes, so our water reporter is changing for the better. We currently have a mobile application that our water reporters use. However, it's not the most user-friendly app, and we really want to engage community members. And to do that, we need a user-friendly app. So we are in the process of developing a new platform, which is going to make it much easier for not only our community members to use, but also for us, the program team on the back end to extract that data um, in a much more comprehensive way to really help us move the needle forward on the health of Casco Bay. So if you are interested in learning more, please sign up to be a volunteer with us. You can attend our events, learn about marine science and Casco Bay, and really help us in our work. The link should be coming to you in the chat, but you can find that link on our website as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, Heather. Ivy. Welcome. Hey, Heather. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody always loves hearing from you since you're our lead advocate. Um, you're the Casco Bay Keeper. For guests yes. that are new to our organization, can we explain to them what exactly that means? Yes. Um, I often describe my role as being the Lorax for the Bay, and meaning that I speak for the water. And I have to say, it's like an absolute passion. Like um, I have a, a self-designed major in environmental studies as an undergrad. And 
I designed my major to do exactly this. And that was um, before the waterkeeper movement started. So it's an honor and a privilege to be the baykeeper. And the essence of the role is to meet with staff internally, get out in the field, collect data, talk with everyone, including, you know, looking at what our water reporters are doing and how other people who interact with the bay, what they're observing and seeing and learning about the bay, to take all of that information and to tease out from it what are the problems that most threaten the health of the bay and the rivers that feed the bay, and then to work towards solutions. And we often do that in collaborations, but sometimes we're the only advocate in the room, and that typically happens when we're commenting on uh, things like permits issued under the Clean Water Act. And uh, just to put a plug in for the team approach, um, our capacity to do baykeeping yeah, is really enhanced by um, Heather being on the our team. Thank you, Ivy. I also happen to have a passion for you know this kind of work. So, um, so we just heard from Mike and Sarah about the data that they collected over the summer. Mike shared some highlights of the data he collected with the SANS that showed some of the effects of the rainy weather we had. Sarah, Sarah shared some data collected by the water reporters about observed effects. So as the baykeeper, how do you use that data in your advocacy? Um, so we typically describe the summer as field season, even though through continuous monitoring, we're collecting data year round. The field season is when we as staff are primarily out around the bay and collecting information and data. We typically call the fall the meeting season. And so at this time of year, we're not only having meetings internally, as Mike was alluding to, where we're really looking at the data and comparing it to data that others are collecting, like the combined sort overflow data or our um, river gauge data. Uh, but we're also in meetings in broader coalitions to compare data, share concerns, and identify um, problems. So that is how how we use this data to sort of tease out and move the process along of addressing problems that affect Casco Bay, because it's never as easy as, um, uh, you know, just taking one step and we're curing mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. Baykeeping, when I remember when I was first hired and we were going through, you know, all of the topics that you work on, I was like, Ivy has her hand in everything. Um, but even though it covers so many topics, it always prioritizes climate change and pollution delivered by stormwater. Starting with climate change, can you tell us how this year's data will be used or might be used in the future to address climate change? Yeah, so our task in climate change is is pretty difficult. First off, it's right reducing the sources of climate change. And um, and there are, we, we do that work through coalitions. And then we really focus on how do we make our bay resilient? Like we know the bay is changing. Uh, we know it's going to continue to change. And so we, we need to sort of prepare for that and, and do our best thinking and work toward helping the bay be resilient and healthy. Mm -hmm for generations to come. And so the first thing about this summer was the best modeling predictions for uh, Casco Bay indicated that temperatures would continue to rise, that we would uh, have very erratic weather patterns, um, periods of drought followed by periods of intense storms, more uh, intense storms, you know, like a 100 year storm or 25 year storm, whatever the category is, these are gonna occur uh, more frequently, and um, it, along with this increase in precipitation, that more and more of that precipitation would be rain rather than snow. So, for example, in January of uh, 2023, the, the warm temperatures that Mike was showing, we had a really huge rain event. And that's like so completely different, right? Because it that means you don't have the snow on the landscape anymore um, and, and spring runoff. You have just sheeting off of frozen ground mm -hmm. all of this rainwater delivering um, loads of pollution to the bay. So first is um, we this 
confirmed for us that we have some concerning trends we need to consider in the work that we're doing. Second, um, so how we use that data then, um, uh, I'm coordinating the team of scientists that Mike is part of um, and the sensor squad is part of that works from New Hampshire to Canada to try to develop a uniform set of standards that can be used to accurately monitor ocean acidification so that we have good data to set policy recommendations and resilience recommendations, resilience strategies for the Bay. Second, um, I've been reappointed to the Coastal Marine Working Group of the Maine Climate Council. That council was formed shortly after Governor Mills assumed office. And um, the plan was the first time around to create a state climate action plan that was built on existing public-private collaborations to address climate change. And in this iteration, we're um, updating the initial strategies that made it into that plan. And so the roles that we'll be playing, building upon what we did last time, is I am co-chairing the monitoring subcommittee of that group and looking at um, how the uh, monitoring work it, it can then support policy. And I'm also on the uh, Blue Carbon um, Nature-Based Solutions Group, and that Sarah alluded to that. Eelgrass is a critical nearshore habitat. Blue carbon means it can store um, carbon dioxide and help reduce the effects of carbon emission in the marine environment. And nearshore, because it's a rooted plant, it, it helps with resiliency from storm surge. And then, um, uh, Finally, we are part of a collaborative grant to study why we're losing eelgrass in Casco Bay, and we'll be doing that work next summer. Please ask questions about it, because <laughs> I know, like, this is a kind of question, like, Heather and I could just talk all day, and we do, but um, <laughs> I can't do that with you right now, but I'll be happy to answer your questions. So, Heather, back to you. We do talk about this all day. And yes, ask us questions and look out for our updates. Um, our development team and our communications team is really great about getting updates out to you all. So that was a great recap on how we are addressing climate change. We cannot forget about stormwater. Um, tell us a little bit about it. This year was crazy. Mike alluded to the CSO volumes that we saw. Um, tell us about stormwater. I mean, I think if Mother Nature, you know, the, Mother Nature was not subtle this year. In uh -huh. terms of you're saying like, we cannot forget about stormwater. She was not subtle. She's like, you will not forget about stormwater. And so, um, so yes, it renewed our focus on this. Uh, stormwater is a really difficult uh, problem to work on because it sheets off of our landscape and we don't control when it rains or the volumes of water with each storm. So it makes it difficult. So we try to work where we can. And two of the really big um, aspects we're working on are uh, one, there are certain categories of stormwater that are regulated under the Clean Water Act. And for those, there are permits that um, put some limitations on or some practices in place to reduce the amount of pollution that gets carried to our waterways. And um, the one that you've probably seen in our newsletters uh, over the last couple of years is the Municipal Separate Storm Source System Permit, known as the MS4 permit. And we have uh, advocated for and secured significant advances in that permit that will protect our waterways. Um, and then in the year ahead, the, uh, the other categories of stormwater that are regulated under the Clean Water Act to a certain extent are construction on large projects and commercial and industrial. On the construction mm -hmm. front, we'll be commenting on the main uh, general permit that regulates construction. And then uh, there's a special permit in the Long Creek watershed around the main mall uh, for commercial and industrial discharges. And we'll be commenting on that as well. Because we can't do much under the Clean Water Act, um, one of the other regulatory you, uh, tools that we use is looking at stormwater regulation. So on a municipal level, in that MS4 permit we referenced, we um, advocated for and included a requirement that municipalities have to adopt ordinances 
um, that require the use of um, of special techniques on uh, it, it, during development and redevelopment to treat stormwater and to keep stormwater runoff on site. And then we advocated for our um, revision of Chapter 500, both through the State Climate Action Plan and in a resolve before the legislature. And a process will begin um, next week to revise the state's um, stormwater rules that uh, regulate large developments and redevelopment sites. We're super excited about that. And Heather, it's a really great example of incremental changes right incremental work how we how we keep building we look at data then we try to find solutions because we saw stormwater as a problem uh, we worked on it as part of the climate council last time we got it into a law we've been working on a permit on the side and now the process of revising the the regulations is is in place through a really thoughtful process that our department of environmental protection has put together so um, this work takes uh, patience and uh, strategic steps along the way. It does. I was just thinking the same thing. It's with a lot, lot of our issues, we don't just make a comment, you know, put a cap on it, file it, and we're done. It's we, with many of our issues, we continuously follow up. We continuously strategize to um, problem solve in other ways. So just like the Bay is changing, our advocacy is constantly changing. We got to yeah. keep up with it. It's health is kind of like ours. You know, there isn't like a pill we can take to make us be like healthy and perfect. We have to do all of these different things. And that's, that is how our work is um, with the Bay. Sarah and Mike, if you wouldn't mind joining us again, we are going to jump to Q&A. So, Mike, I know this one's for you because we talked about this um, mm -hmm. this summer. The very large offshore algal bloom that occurred in the Gulf of Maine, did we see any of it in the Bay? We did not so much. I think uh, from time to time, we might have seen parts of it, but for the, for the most part, it stayed out of Casco Bay. That was impressive. That was a unprecedented bloom in the, in the larger Gulf, but um, we didn't see much in, in Casco Bay specifically. Yeah, and there was a lot of scientists tracking that and asking questions about it, um, but you're right, we didn't see much of it dip into the Bay. In fact, Mike, it was weird because um, we didn't see a lot of blooms in Casco Bay this summer. No, it was a fairly quiet year uh, for phytoplankton blooms um, for whatever reason. We'll... We'll look for that nitrogen data shortly. Yes. But interesting. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, Mike, I'm going to stick with you because we've talked about um, this as well. That lower salinity that we're seeing, is it mostly on the surface mm. or does the rain help mix it? Or do you sometimes see like, layers on top of one another in the water column. Yep, that's exactly it, the layers. Um, mm -hmm. Through that seasonal work, we'll look at um, the water column through a profile of measurements. And it does tend to be, of course, it, it floats on the, the denser ocean water. So these um, these freshwater layers gen generally float on top. And that's where we're seeing this mostly. Um, and right. our continuous stations are in shallow enough water that they're they're showing up. They're in three to five meters of water, depending on the tide. So they catch that that freshwater lens as well. Yeah, we call it, yeah, the freshwater lens that kind of floats on top of the denser seawater. Um, let's see here. You all have so many good questions. I want to ask them all. Um, Sarah. How can people help contribute to the Water Reporter program? Sign up. <laughs> uh, as, I said, <laughs> as I said, we are in the middle of some changes. So we have not signed up um, uh, up to this moment. I would say hold off for now and we're up and running and then you can get trained along with everybody else. But feel free to get in contact with me 
we are still asking our water reporters who have the app to take pictures. We still need your observations, uh, but you can email me. Um, I can drop that in the chat and, and we can talk about how you can get involved until we have made this transition smoothly. Thanks, Sarah. Ivy, I have a good question for you. Um, we talked, you talked a lot about climate change and there are some things that we don't have control over like global carbon dioxide emissions. I mean, we can do our own personal individual work on that, but that's not within our mission. So given that the climate is going to change, but we do work on other issues such as pollution, how important is it to reduce pollution into our waters given that climate change is happening? So I want to make sure I understand this question. Mm -hmm because there's sort of two facets to me is one is like, how important is it to understand the rate of uh, carbon emissions and, and um, whether or not we're reducing them? And then the second um, facet that this question might be implying is if, if we're going, you know, if this is a major problem, is it still important to focus on other types of pollution? Start with that. Okay, yes. The answer is yes, it's still important because there are other threats to the bay that are exacerbated by, by climate change. Stormwater is an example of that. Um, so it, everything that runs off into the bay, like let's say PFAS or uh, nitrogen or pesticides, um, all of that will be aggravated by climate change. And so um, that means that we need to focus on those issues more and reduce uh, those pollutants more. And so we very strongly support efforts um, such as those taken by Portland and South Portland to pass strong pesticide and fertilizer ordinances to kind of keep those elements out of our stormwater in the first place. Yeah, so that's interesting that you mentioned those ordinances that they're, pa that they're passing because we have another question. Is it possible, is it something to think about whether the decreased algae that we saw could be attributed to increased regulations for that are being passed with lawn care? It's, it's possible. We don't have that everywhere. So if we were, say, right. just looking at um, South Portland, you know, is there a correlation between um, the implementation of the uh, fertilizer ordinance and where we're seeing less? Um, some of the other things that we're really thinking through are just like the gardens in our backyards was sunlight the limiting factor this year um, mm -hmm. so that there just wasn't enough sunlight to um, produce the kind of uh, blooms that we've seen during like the hotter, drier years. You get a slug of storm water in a hot drought year. And then immediately it's sunny again and very warm. And that, that like just sets up the uh, the nuisance algal blooms. Yeah, so it's it possible, but I think we would have to look at that data over time. Right, it's a good question, and we we sincerely hope and expect <laughs> yes. We do hope yes. Um, Sarah, a good question for you because you did a program on this this summer with Jeremy from the Wells Reserve. Um, blue crabs, we know that they are here. Um, they are an invasive species. Can you just give us like, tell us a little bit about blue, blue crabs, whether or not you think anything can be done about them. Are they going to be a product? Are we going to make blue crabs into something? I don't know. I am not an expert, but from what I have learned from Jeremy is that yes, blue crabs are here in Casco Bay and we're talking Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, blue crabs. They're big crabs. They do occupy the same tropic level as lobsters. So they are apex predators at the top of the food chain. We don't know how they're going to interact with lobsters. Are they going to compete for food? Are they going to fight? Uh, we also don't know how they're going to interact with green crabs. Maybe they'll eat the green crabs and it will take care of that problem. <laughs> uh, but I do want to make one clarification is that 
they actually are not an invasive species with climate change as the temperature in Casco Bay is rising, they are simply moving upwards. They are migrating. So we call it range migration or expansion, which is often confused with invasive species. So green crabs are invasive. They came over from Asia in the 1800s and have been here since then, but they only recently became a problem when our winters started becoming warmer and they were not dying off uh, because of the cold water in the winter. So same with blue crabs. Blue crabs have been spotted here in prior years, but they get up here and then they die over the winter. But because the water is staying warm, they're not dying off. So a lot of unanswered questions right now. There's just a lot of training of blue crabs by lots of scientists um, in Casco Bay. And yeah, another another nod to our community who is doing the reporting on whether or not they see blue crabs. Um, back to our data, Mike, we collect a lot of it. We um, operate under a specific program so that our data can be used by the state as well as the federal government. So our data, we are very proud of it. It's very good. Is yep. it available to others? What if a researcher wants it? What if a teacher or a concerned citizen wants it? Absolutely. We do this all the time. We'll share whatever parts of the data or all of it that that is requested uh, from both the seasonal work and the continuous work. Yeah. So as we mentioned earlier, we put, um, yep. after all of our raw data, like all of the literally millions of numbers, after we get all of that, we consolidate it into a graph and we put it up on the website. So that's like an easy way to look at our data. If you want to look at all of those little numbers, you can always email me or Mike yep. and tell us what you're looking for, what measurement you want, what year you want, and we will gladly send it to you. Yep. Um, I'm going to stick though with you, Mike. <clears throat> Um, we monitor in Casco Bay. Our organization's name is Friends of Casco Bay. Do we know at all how our bay compares to other bays like Penobscot Bay or Portsmouth Harbor? Are they experiencing, um, do you know if they're experiencing similar changes? Do you know if there are people monitoring in those bays that might know the answer? There certainly are, and I'll have Ivy jump in as well. Uh, we are part of a network that includes groups up and down the, the state of Maine into New Hampshire. Um, I, I believe generally, depends on the, the measurement we're looking at, but generally there is a lot of similarities from bay to bay. Uh, we don't always look at the same things, but um, there are a lot of groups doing a lot of work, and we are very good at talking with as many of them as we can. We, we are all in different committees together. Uh, we're always sharing data. Um, so it's it's a it's a tight network, um, even some offshore people as well, as well as the coast. But Ivy, do you have anything to add to that? We we certainly do work with other groups up and down the coast. Yeah, it's a really big question, right? Like yeah. what what is monitoring and what are you monitoring? Right. And so um, there is a lot of data collection, and we tend to do comparisons by issue. So, for example, we're part of this network that um, is looking at ocean acidification, we're part of another network looking at blue carbon sources. Um, we, through the Climate Council and the monitoring subcommittee there, are looking more comprehensively at different types of monitoring. There are other people who are monitoring for social changes, right? How this is changing um, the ability for generational transfer of, of, of lobster um, vessels and businesses or, or soft shell clamming. So um, do we know the specificities of other bays? No. Um, are we part of networks where sometimes there's comparisons with other bays? Are we try to be helpful to partners who are just beginning their monitoring efforts? Yes. Yep, yeah, and we'll certainly reach out for specific questions like uh, the mm -hmm. large offshore phytoplankton bloom this year. We'll ask others 
if they're seeing something like that, if they're not seeing that bloom in their bay this year, that, that those sorts of questions we, we certainly ask. Yeah, we do talk to a lot of different partners and um, we certainly can't monitor at all. So we're so thankful for the work that our partners do. And one um, last thing I think on that uh, topic, sorry. Um, we're part of the Waterkeeper Alliance, which means that we're part of a network of waterkeepers around the world. And in the North Atlantic region, there are times that um, I really want to consult with the water keepers who are a little further south of us, like Long Island Sound and Great Bay in particular, because they are, as, as problems come up the coast, like warming temperatures, disappearing eel grass beds, they're experimenting before we are um, mm -hmm. with some of the um, ways that we're trying to make our bay healthy into the future or keep our bay healthy into the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's another level of networking that we do that is informative where we can try to learn by what other people are piloting or experimenting with and think about what pertains here. Yeah, on the, I'm gonna ask one more question and it's somewhat on the subject of networking because the city of Portland is a partner of ours. We do, we work with their stormwater coordinator, with their um, wastewater department and, we everybody sees the giant project happening on Bat Cove. Um, what do you think, Ivy, is the impact of having the sewer treatment plant right on the water's edge? And what is the impact that the work um, along Bat Cove is going to have? And then that'll be our last question. Okay, so it looks like there's two questions. Two questions. So first, um, wastewater treatment plants are always along the water's edge because they discharge into wa our waterways. And um, so I think you're always going to find that. So there's two implications of that. One is um, our wastewater treatment plants are one of the very best ways we have to reduce water pollution. Mm -hmm. And we're very fortunate in Casco Bay to have um, people dedicated to that mission at the, the, the major facilities we have around the bay. And so although we may not always agree on everything, we can often work with people to get advances to protect um, water quality. And East End in particular has taken on some projects where um, during intense storms, it goes from operating at a capacity of about 18 million gallons a day to 80 million gallons a day as it takes in a lot of storm water and treats it. Not fully to the same extent it would if it wasn't running and that's called bypass operation. It disinfects everything, removes the large solids. So it does a really big job to help with stormwater reduction. And then they also worked to um, change how they're operating their plant to really reduce nitrogen pollution into the bay. And that's had the single biggest impact in reducing uh, the effects of nitrogen pollution in greater Portland Harbor. So um, the complicating factor of this very astute question is that because our treatment plants are in the near shore with sea level rise and storm surge, they're going to be facing increasing challenges. And I think there'll be some major infrastructure discussions that mm -hmm. municipalities are going to have to have to make sure that these plants can continue to function. Um, the storage conduits swills on, which means like time to wrap up. Um, <laughs> the storage conduits is very briefly are going to once the series, this, this is the third in a series of uh, storage tanks and conduits around Back Cove, when that's completely up and running, the, the two facets of it are, this is the third piece, it will hold storm water until that east end facility has the chance to um, accept and treat the storm water before it's discharged. So it won't completely eliminate combined sewer overflows to Back Cove, but it will significantly reduce them and treat the most polluted, allow the most polluted storm water to be treated. We can't wait for it to be up and running. I'm going to turn it back over to Will. I can see his pop down. Heather. Thank you, Ivy, Mike, and Sarah. And most of all, thank you for uh, everyone who joined us, uh, spending an hour with us. Uh, hope you learned something. Hope this inspired you to uh, help us uh, take care of Casco Bay. There are three ways you can you can help us. One is by becoming a volunteer. You can contact Sarah Freshly about that. Uh, the second is to donate. Uh, our, our work is supported by our members. Uh, and just coincidentally, today is Giving Tuesday. So 
Uh, if you haven't made a donation to us yet this year, uh, please uh, consider giving to Friends of Casco Bay. And the third is, if you're already a volunteer or you're already a member, the other way you can help us is to tell your neighbors, friends, uh, and family about uh, events like these and about our organization and, uh, and about uh, work happening to protect Casco Bay. Thank you for joining us. Take care.